We're all right, everyone. Welcome to Harvest Fellowship. If you're new, I'm clearly not Pastor Paul. I don't have his voice, and I don't have his mustache either. So our beloved pastor is on vacation, so we can be praying for him. But before I get into the word, I wanted to actually share with you um, some lyrics of a song, and then we'll pray. Coming off of the resurrection weekend, right, we come off of this mountaintop experience, this euphoric type of weekend where we're reminded of all the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. And I think it's easy to kind of drift into this uh, kind of the normalcy of our day-to-day lives, right, our workplaces and schools and and things like that. So tonight we're going to be talking about what the, the resurrection, the glorious gospel means to us today. But this song came to my mind and I just wanted to read a few lyrics It's called A Right Response. It says, you were bruised and you were beaten for our wholeness and our healing. You were shamed and you were forsaken so we would never be abandoned. You were buried in the tomb so we could rise again with you. Now you're seated in the heavens and your spirit is within us. Now my victory is won. It is finished. It is done. So we say thank you. Oh, thank you. We say thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, my Jesus, the sacrifice you made leaves us in wonder. The weight of all our sin upon your shoulders and the only right response is to to say thank you. Oh, thank you. In the last verse, it says, oh, Jesus, you gave it all to give us life abundant. Purchasing our freedom is your kindness. The only right response is to say thank you, thank you, we say thank you, I say thank you, I say thank you. Let's pray and then we'll get into God's word tonight. Father, we come before you and we thank you and we praise you for all you've done in our lives. Father, we thank you that you sent your son, that Jesus Christ, you willingly We're about the will of the Father and you went on to that cross for us, for our sin. And we thank you, Lord, that you rose again, defeating the grave, giving us a hope, giving us a future promise. And so, Lord, as we dive into your word tonight, we pray that you would speak. You would be the one that's glorified. And we trust, Lord, that you're faithful and that your word never returns void. So would you teach us tonight all you have to say to us? We love you and praise you. It's in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, well, we're going to be in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, only one verse tonight. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. It's going to be two parts because I'll be with you again next Wednesday. Part two will be verses 14 through 16. So maybe you guys can read ahead and study. But if you want to title this message, it's the response to the reality of the resurrection. The response to the reality of the resurrection. That's what Peter is going to give us tonight. But before we get into the text, I think it's important that we understand the context of, of what's going on. We want to make sure we understand what Peter is trying to communicate to these first century believers and to us tonight as we parachute in to this book. So obviously in verse one, it talks about the apostle Peter being the author. This is the same man, as you know, that denied Jesus three times, right? If you remember the third time he denied Jesus, he says, I do not know this man you were talking about. When you read that, you can feel the emotion come off the page. As he goes away weeping bitterly, it's the same man that Jesus, by his great mercy, then comes and appears to Peter. And he says, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me, Peter? And Peter goes, yes, I love you, Lord. Then he says, well, tend to, shepherd, feed my flock. Same Peter, then then there in Acts at Pentecost, right? He stands up and he preaches that fiery, that powerful sermon where he quotes the prophet Joel, And he says, and it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What an amazing turnaround. And so he's writing to these now first century believers. This is AD 64, give or take. It's about 30 or so years after the resurrection of Christ. Okay, it's written during the reign of Nero. And we all know that Nero went down as one of the most infamous rulers of Rome. He was a hideous ruler when it came to how he treated people. And it was at this time that the burning of Rome was happening. 
And you remember that he cast the blame on Christians and he did some insidious things to our brothers and sisters in this time period, right? I won't go into those details. So these believers are scattered throughout this Roman, the, these Roman provinces in Asia Minor through these different cities and Peter's writing to them. These are believers that are under immense pressure. They're under immense persecution and quite obviously they needed to be lifted up. They needed to be encouraged. And if we remember, Peter is going to exhort them, right? Peter was well familiar with persecution. He was beaten, he was imprisoned and he would later be crucified upside down according to church history. So he's writing to them to recall, to, to cause them to remember who they are, what the Lord has done for them and how they are now to live as born again believers during immense, immensely difficult situations, right? We can identify with that here tonight, though we're not under persecution, maybe we will be, who knows? But we all have our own struggles of our own, so this applies to us as well. Peter very much echoed what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. He said, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. The reality is, when we become believers... We celebrate the death and resurrection of Christ. We are now in a spiritual war. We are in war. There's a conflict between the old and the new. We all know that, between light and darkness. And the walk in the way that Christ walk is going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging. It's not whimsical, right? We're called to die to ourselves, to pick up our crosses and to what? To follow in the footsteps of Christ. In light of this mission, right, there's a real enemy too, an enemy that's been defeated, but an enemy that wants to do nothing more than to rob you and I of our standing with Christ. He wants to rob our joy and our hope. He wants to rob that future glory that we have. And so he's out to get us. He's out to attack us. That's why Paul in Ephesians 6 says, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. And, and what? Put on the full armor of God. We'll refer back to that again tonight. So in the first 12 verses of 1 Peter, we have this buildup. We have this real reality that Peter is going to be calling these believers and calling us to look back and hold on to. I want to note a few verses. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A new birth and a living hope. Verse four, he talks about the reality of our inheritance. And notice what he says about this inheritance. It's imperishable, it's unfading, it's undefiled, and it's eternally reserved. Praise God for that. Verse five, he talks about the reality of our omnipotent protection. He talks about us being protected by the power of God through faith. Obviously, these believers needed to know that their protection was in something beyond their circumstances. Verse six through eight, he talks about the reality of true godly joy. And look at the end of verse eight. He says, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Amazing. And then drum roll, verse nine, the reality of our salvation, the outcome of our faith is the what? The salvation of our souls. Okay, so we get into verse 13 and we see that word, therefore. We all know what that means. It's, we look back at something that he's, he's given to us already. Therefore, in light of this monumental shift in your life, believer, there must be a response. And that's what we're, what we're going to be looking at tonight. Uh, the main question we want to answer is, what should this glorious reality produce in the heart and the life of the Christian? What should this glorious reality produce in the heart and life of a Christian? Remember what Jesus said in John 17. He says this, as you sent me, he's praying to the father. This is his high priestly prayer. And he's speaking to the father. And he says, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Right? We're saved to be sent as ambassadors of Jesus Christ into a place of darkness 
to be what? The light. That is what we're on mission to do. Salvation brings a new biblical mandate into our lives. So let's see what Peter has to say. He gives us three exhortations in verse 13. These are three imperatives. These three aorist tense verbs. And this is what the aorist tense, if you don't know, means. It says, these are all things we are to do as a result of what's already been done for us. This is what we now do in response of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And notice the first one he says in verse 13, prepare your minds for action. Prepare. Anazonomy in the Greek, it means to gird up. We've heard of that before. After Paul exhorts these believers in Ephesians 6 to put on the full armor of God, he says in verse 14, stand firm having girded your loins with truth. We see this all throughout the Old Testament as well. For example, God told Jeremiah, now gird up your loins. And then he says, stand up and speak to them all which I have commanded to you. And in the the literal sense of the phrase, it means that you remove an obstacle so that you're able to do something. You remove an obstacle in order so that you can do something. And Peter's going to give us the spiritual implications of that. Jeremiah had to gird up in order to arise and then speak to the people of God. And this phrase, gird up, prepare your minds, is a very familiar Hebrew expression. And it means three things, preparedness, a readiness, and a willingness, okay? B.C. Caffin says this, Christians are pilgrims and strangers. Peter calls these believers aliens. They must not loiter on their way. They must press toward the mark. The journey is long and laborious. They must gather up their robes for there are many miry places and there is much pollution in the world. So he's speaking metaphorically. And that's why Peter here is speaking metaphorically to suggest that we need to prepare our minds in order to do something. We need to prepare our minds for this very present and future spiritual conflict that we're gonna face on a day-to-day life as we await the return of Jesus Christ. And notice he says, prepare your minds, right? What's mind? Well, in the Greek, it's dianoia. It's the reflective faculty of the Christian. It's where the battle is waged. That's why the Bible talks so much about protecting your mind, being transformed by the renewing of your mind, taking every thought captive, the Bible says. And how are we to prepare our minds for this spiritual uh, conflict, for this war? What does this look like in our day-to-day lives? Well, I think first it's, again, removing these obstacles, removing anything that can lead us to sin. Right, protecting ourselves from temptation, protecting our, our, ourselves from the attacks of the enemy, from our minds from going to places where it then leads to sin, internally or physically. It, it means bracing our minds. That term bracing means fastening down, strengthening the core, the nucleus of our mind by reminding ourselves of who we are and what Jesus Christ has done for us past tense and what he's gonna do in the future, what he's promised. And then it also means readying our minds. What does it mean to ready something, to prepare something, right? That's why we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So we prepare our minds. The Bible talks about fixing our minds or like Colossians 3, 12 says, we set our minds on the things that are what? Above, not on the things that are on the earth, okay? Henry Morris says that preparing our mind is to be serious and thoughtful rather than shallow and flippant in attitude. And I was thinking about that. Well, why is it so serious? Well, it goes back to we're in a real war, but I don't really think we quite treat life that way, right? We're in a literal fight for our lives, aren't we? We're under attack constantly. Your children are under attack constantly. You just look at the world and you realize it's not whimsical fun and games anymore. It never has been really. And no, and though we've been given victory over the enemy, we've been given a future victory. Our adversary, the devil, wants to destroy. Like I was saying before, he wants to come in and disrupt. That's why Peter is so adamant that we prepare our minds for this future action. Ephesians 6, 12 
going back. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. This is before he tells us to put on the full armor. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Let's go back to that metaphor, that girding up the loins. These Jewish men, whether they worked, whether they did any sort of activity, but specifically when they were readying themselves for physical war, they had to tie their robes around their waist, fasten their robes around their belt. So they, they would be ready to do what they needed to do. My dad always taught me to uh, tie my shoes. Don't wear your shoes loose. And I always thought, well, why? Well, he was saying, so that you are ready for something. If you have loose shoes, loose laces, they'll work as an obstacle if you ever need to run from danger or flee from a dangerous situation. Or what happens if we need to go into danger and to protect someone? Tighten your shoes, make sure your laces are cinched tightly, prepare yourself what may come in the future. Make sense? I think what Peter is trying to say, here's the point. In, ver in this first part of verse 13 is that salvation does not and should not produce passivity in the life of a believer, but demands that we each individually and corporately make an active choice to cultivate an attitude of obedience. Are we doing that in our day-to-day -day lives? Are we cultivating a readiness for all the Lord has willed to come into our life whether he wills it to happen or he allows it to happen, are we preparing ourselves to be ready to respond to whatever the Lord brings our way, right? Whether it's tragedy, temptation, spiritual warfare, unexpected loss, financial disaster, you name it, you all have been through it. And maybe some of you are going through tremendous difficulty. I know some of you are dealing with physical ailments that are frightening, right? We prepare for tests by studying. We prepare for our fields or careers by getting an education, right? We prepare for future car wrecks by having car insurance. We prepare for death by having written wills. You prepare for the power going out by having supplies. How much more important spiritually, and that's what Peter is trying to drive into these early believers. Prepare your minds for this future spiritual conflict that will come your way. Notice, secondly, he says, prepare your mind for actions and keep sober in spirit. Some of your translations may just say, be sober, be sober. It's the Greek word nepho. It's the idea of making sure that you keep all of your faculties, all of yourself in order, fully operational, free from confusion, right? We understand what that word sober means. The drunk man is not aware his faculties are not all present. It means a, a well-balanced and self-controlled reality. And there's a few different aspects of this word sober that I want to talk about. The first one is it, it's used synonymously with being watchful or being on alert. We see this later. If you want to flip with me, you can to 1 Peter 5 verses 8 through 9. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9, he says, Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him and stand firm in your faith. And we'll stop there. Stand firm in your faith. Resist him. Be watchful. Why? Because the ad your adversary, the devil, he's a lion that wants to devour you. It's what Jesus tells his disciples to do in Mark 13. He says it four times, if you remember. I'll just paraphrase. He says, take heed, keep on the alert. For you do not know when the appointed time will come. Stay on the alert, he says. Then he says again, be on the alert. And then a fourth time, he says, what I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. There's a book called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. It's by a Puritan named Thomas Brooks. Let me read you a quick quote 
of this dynamic of what Peter is talking about. He said, beloved, Satan, being fallen from light to darkness, from felicity to misery, from heaven to hell, from an angel to a devil, is so full of malice and envy that he will leave no means unattempted, whereby he may make all others eternally miserable with himself. He being shut out of heaven and shut up under the chains of darkness till the judgment of the great day makes use of all of his power and skill to bring the sons of men into the same condition and condemnation with himself. And so Peter's saying, so believer, so Christian, be watchful, be on the alert, protect your children. Protect your homes, guard your hearts, guard your minds, guard your souls because you are under attack. And there's a real threat that is coming against you called the devices of the enemy. Are we aware of that tonight? Being sober also means to be sensible, to be clear headed, not being easily influenced, uh, being temperate, right? It means don't let any of your body be overcome by the intoxication of sin. We think of it usually with alcohol or drugs, but here we're talking about something even deeper, the intoxication of sin. Paul says this in Titus 2, 11 through 12, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly. And in the King James Version, it says, Live soberly to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. And God tells us, how do we live soberly? What do we set our minds on? Well, Philippians 4, 8 says this, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, If there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, do what? Dwell on these things. Colossians 3, 2 says, set your mind again on things that are above. The vertical. We so often get stuck here, don't we? God's saying, hey, keep your mind here, especially in light of this persecution that these believers were going through, especially in light of a loved one dying, especially in light of a cancer diagnosis or a Parkinson's diagnosis, you name it. You name it. Being sober minded and remaining that way also takes a willingness to fight. It takes a grit. That's why it's called seriousness, right? We need to adjust our thinking when it comes to what the word of God, I think, is saying, right? The idea of remaining and being sober is not a casual thing. Let me give you an example. How does the drug addict beat his addiction, right? He doesn't beat his addiction to cocaine by moderating the cocaine habit. The person who's addicted to pornography does not beat, or she does not beat her addiction by moderation, right? There's a a war that we wage with the flesh, right? The Bible says that we what? Crucify the flesh. That's Galatians 5, 24. We just celebrated what? Christ being crucified, right? It was the most insane way to kill someone. It was the most disturbing way to kill someone in that, that time frame. If you study it, it's, it's absolutely hideous, right? And he's saying, in the same way, crucify this flesh. Jesus calls us to resist the devil so that he'll flee from us, right? That idea of resisting, when James talks about that, it takes courage. It takes a willingness, right? What does resisting a force look like? It's standing firm, it's looking at it, it's taking up your shield, putting on your helmet and leaning into it, isn't it? It's not casual, it's not whimsical. It's something we have to take seriously. Be sober, be watchful, be aware of the war. Keep your mind on the battle plan of Jesus Christ is what Peter is saying, right? His word, that's why we preach the word, right? We preach the word, we keep our mind on the word so that we can live by the word. And be willing to fight. 
And we, we're, we're willing to fight and we can fight because we use the tactics and the weapons of godly warfare. That's how we fight this fight. Not on our own, not in our own flesh, not in our own strength. Through the power of the spirit, we use the prescribed method of warfare. And that's God's word. Notice the third imperative. The third imperative. He says, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You Christian, fix your hope, notice on grace, on grace. Peter understood grace and he preached the product of it, hope. He was actually called the apostle of hope throughout church history. He understood what was given to him and what it now meant for him and what was awaiting him. Right? I want to highlight four things here. Four things about this last part of verse 13. Notice when he says hope. First, what is hope? I think it's more than important in our day and age to define terms because the world has a different way of defining and applying hope. What is hope? Well, hope is not wishful thinking, it's not a word referring to uncertainties. Peter is not saying that hope is calculating odds or working out the percentages of what may or may not happen and just kind of waiting it out wondering. Hope isn't holding on to something empty, unreal, non-tangible. Hope also, and most importantly, is not subjective. It's not temperamental. It's not subject to change or to sifting cultures or times. Okay? Rather, we as the people of God, according to what God's word says, fix our hope on the objective. Okay? You guys all know that. Fix our hope on the objective, on the eternal. Hope actually in the original language is defined as waiting for salvation with joy and full confidence. Notice we wait for it, meaning hope is futuristic. It's looking forward. And notice it's waiting for something very specific, very determined. We're not waiting for something unknown. We're waiting for something that's already been said will happen. Something that's finished. Remember what Christ said on the cross. It's finished, he said. And we're waiting for that future glorification. Amazing what Peter is communicating to these believers. And how do we wait for it? With joy and full confidence. Why joy? Where does joy come in when you're in the middle of pain and sorrow and suffering and seemingly hopeless situations? It seems a little unfair to say have joy in the midst of nothing but joylessness, right? Well, joy because God has promised this future hope and he not only promised it, but we know that God doesn't lie and everything that he says will come to pass, right? This future hope and this glory, this final prize that final crown that James talks about, that crown of life that God says he's going to place on the heads of those who love him. That's what we're hoping for. And that's why we can hope. And that's why joy comes into play. So whether hell or high water, right, or desert or valley experiences, we can confidently expect and confidently know. There's men out there that are preaching that you can't really fully know. The Bible says something different. Brothers and sisters, you can be confident in this. You can know without doubt that what your God has said will come to pass. It will come to pass. And we'll rejoice all the more because of it. Biblical hope ultimately is the joy that is rooted in the confident belief that Jesus Christ died and rose and will return. Okay, biblical hope is the joy that is rooted in the confident belief, faith that Jesus Christ died and rose and now futuristic, he will return. Second, notice grace. Our hope is so hopeful because of the object of our hope. Who's the object of our hope? The great, the wonderful, the merciful, the long suffering, the immeasurably loving, gracious giving God. It's amazing. Pastor Craig walked us through grace, right? What was grace? It's God's unmerited favor to undeserving sinners. God's unmerited favor 
to undeserving people like ourselves, right? This is why the first 12 verses are so wonderful because you see God so graciously and freely giving what all of us so desperately need. James 4 talks about the God, the great giver of perfect gifts, the God who gives grace. And it's grace being given to us in two ways, his sovereign saving grace and that he changes you radically from a sinner to a saint. And then it's his continuing sanctifying grace that continues with you until you are in glory. Notice third, the word your, this hope is personal. This is where it gets real. This is where I think much of our Christendom misses the, the point, is that you have a personal Christ that was on the cross thinking of you individually, personally, and was dying for your personal sins so that you would have a personal hope. Isn't that amazing? He didn't just die for sin, he died for your personal sin. Your, our hope is personal. It's a gift personally given by the only personal God. This is what differentiates the God of Christianity and our faith from any other false religion because it's personal. He's called our Abba Father, right? In other words, you can experience personal hope in all of your personal struggles because God has personally given it to you. Fourth, he says, fix your hope completely, completely fix on grace. The ESV translation says, set your hope. Other transla uh, translations say, rest your hope. The King James again says, hope to the end. Hope to the end. We place our hope on something, like I've said before, eternal, concrete, immovable. It doesn't fluctuate. It doesn't change. And we do so completely. The Greek word is teleos, which means totally and fully, not 99%, not 99.99, 100%. You place your hope fully and completely on the grace. I don't know, but that gives me hope. I don't know about you guys. It's powerful stuff, powerful stuff. That hope is that confident expectation of God's future fulfilled promises. And notice as we close what Peter says, it's to be what? To be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We place, we fix, we put our hope completely on grace that is to be brought to us at the revelation of our Lord and Savior. David Guzik says this, grace isn't just for the past, when we first gave our lives to Jesus, it isn't only for the present where we live each moment standing in his grace. It isn't also for the future, or but it's also for the future when grace will be brought to us. God has only just began or begun to show us the riches of his grace. Jesus has resurrected. We just celebrated it, but he is returning. He's in process and we need brothers and sisters to be ready, don't we? We need to take this thing we call salvation seriously and do what James is saying. Prepare your minds, be vigilant, be sober, and most importantly, fix that hope on the grace that has been given, that unmerited favor to undeserving people. Something that no one can take away from you, by the way. It's eternally secure. He's faithful. And he will, he will remain faithful. The Bible says he will finish the work that he first started. That's why we can confidently hope because it's in God, the God who's faithful, even when we are unfaithful. And I don't know all of you here tonight. I don't know where you guys are at. So I'm gonna ask a simple question. Are you saved and are you ready? Right, we talk about these things, but are you saved tonight? Do you know that there's a God who created you, who loves you, who sent his son to die for you? Do you know that there's a God who can eradicate all of the mistakes that you've made in the past, that can give you joy moving forward, that you can move on from all the mistakes that you've made and you can experience true freedom? Did you know that there's a God who wants to do that in your life. He's not a distant God. He's a God who's near to the brokenhearted, a God who's personal and who loves you. And if you're here tonight and you're feeling the weight of your sin, 
you're feeling like, you know what? Something's not right and I need to know this. I wanna give you the opportunity to do it. It's simple, it's simple. Repenting of your sin means a turnaround. Pastor Paul talks about this all the time. Romans 9.10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will what? You will be saved. If you confess him as Lord and believe that he is risen from the grave, you can be saved and being saved means forever. And so I wanna just ask, is there anyone here who the Lord is stirring your hearts? You wanna be saved tonight. And I, I, I would ask that you'd raise your hand and we'll pray for you and we'll welcome you into the kingdom of God. Is there anyone here that wants to be saved here? Anyone? Okay. And for us as believers, the followers of Jesus Christ, are we, my question to you tonight as we leave, are we actively waiting in confident expectation for the return of our Lord? Despite the challenges that we're probably gonna face this week and this year and in the years to come, can we Stay in that disposition where we are confidently awaiting the return of the same Lord and the same Savior that went to the cross for us, that defeated the grave for us, and who's going to give us a future hope and glory for eternity. And so my encouragement to you is be hopeful. Be hopeful. Find joy in your salvation. Joy in the fact that Jesus is alive and he's reigning and he's returning. He's alive and he's reigning, and the Bible says that he's interceding right this very moment for us in prayer. Amazing. He's not gone. He's alive, and he's interceding for us because he loves us, and he says, I'm coming for you. He will soon be coming, so let's just find hope. Let's rest. Let's enjoy the peace that surpasses all understanding, and let's live the lives that he's called us to live. Amen. Let's pray, and then we'll get out of here. Well, Father, we come before you tonight humbled at the fact that you would even intervene in our lives. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Father, we were your enemies. We were against you and um, willing, willingly choosing, Lord, to deny you. And you, by your great patience and grace and love, stepped into each one of our lives and changed us, Lord, and caused us to experience a new birth and a new reality, a new hope, Lord, a joy. And I pray, Lord, that you would cause us to just move forward in life, fully living in the grace, in the hope, in the joy that is ours because of your death and your resurrection and your future return. Lord, cause us to be about your business. Cause us to be serious about these minds that you've given to us, these lives that you've called us to live. Cause us not to live because we're trying to earn anything, but cause us to live in obedience because we love you. We love you, Lord, and we praise your holy name. Bless my brothers and sisters as they leave tonight. Bless the children. Bless the youth group. Bless all the ministries, Lord, that are happening. We do all of this for your glory and for your fame. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.